God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, because God is our refuge and strength. We stand together, please, as we share together to sing about the fact that our God rules and reigns. He is the one we worship, even though we can't fully describe him. We don't try to understand him, but we claim that he is above and beyond us. He is indescribable, uncontainable, and a whole bunch of other adjectives that we'll get to as we think about who he is and what he's done.
God promises that he, the one who has started a good work in us, will bring it about to completion. And we are now in the process of having that being done in our lives as he is building what he wants to have done in this world, his kingdom that rules and reigns in our lives. And he desires to spread that as people come to know Christ as their savior and then to grow. So we sing together, build your kingdom here. Please be seated. We have the pleasure this morning of participating in the dedication of a child to the Lord. 
It's not a ceremony performed to ensure that the child gets to heaven, but rather it's more for the parents to dedicate themselves to the training of the child and helping that child to grow. It, they acknowledge that it's a, the child is a gift to them, that God gave them, and they commit themselves to the Lord, to honor the Lord with that child. It's similar to what Mary and Joseph did when they brought baby Jesus to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord, to present him before the Lord and say, he belongs to you. That in mind, Brett, Tris, if you can get Bentley away from Grandma, bring, it, bring him up here. And Mike and Tess are going to come and join you as sponsors, witnesses. Be part of this, this time together. When we got together, you shared some of the things about Bentley and about your desire to raise him and what you wanted to have done this morning and the desire to dedicate him to the Lord as you had already done. Hi, you're looking at me now. We'll see if that goes, <laughs> continues throughout. As you did with Aurora and Bernie as well, that you looking forward to the time when that he could make that personal decision that he would be then baptized for his faith in, in Jesus Christ. So there's a series of questions I'm going to ask, and you can wait till they're all done, and then just respond by saying, we will, and then, then I'll pray to, for you. Will you accept the responsibility to love, provide for, protect, and nurture Bentley? Will you help him to know Jesus Christ as his personal Savior and Lord? Will you pray for him and with him? Will you guide him spiritually using God's word? Will you, when it comes time, though it's a long time in the future, will you release him to whatever path and road God has for him as he belongs really to God? Will you dedicate yourselves to serve the Lord in this way as mom and dad, to care for him as this precious little gift that he is from God. You want to come this way? Let's see. This will work. Let's see if it will work. Okay. Oh, he's struggling. Okay. Let's pray together. Dear God, we do thank you for this precious life. We thank you for the, even the amazing circumstances of his birth and how you protected him and his mom and that he is here with us today. We just thank you for this gift that you've given to us, to Brett, to Tris, to the world. And we do pray that he would truly be a gift to the world, that he would be a person who loves you and follows you and desires to know more about you, and that he'd be able to share that with people. Thank you, God, for Brett and Tris and their desire again to dedicate this little guy, as they've done for and Aurora and Bernie, Pray that you would bless them and guide them, strengthen them, help them in the ways to grow closer to you so they can bring Bentley closer to you as well. Thank you, God, for this time. And we pray that you would, now as we dedicate him and dedicate them to your honor and glory. And we pray for Dad Brett, as in a couple weeks, less than that, he'll be deploying overseas to Europe to serve in our military. And that we thank you for his commitment and his desire to serve, and that he's serving not just our country, but he's serving us as well. And we appreciate that, God. We pray that you protect him, strengthen him, draw him closer to you too, Lord, during this time, and the family close to one another during this time of distance. Thank you, God, again, that we could dedicate Bentley in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray, amen. We made it. We made it. We do have a certificate to help you remember this day. And we will continue to pray for God's blessings upon all of you. Thank you. He understands that that was for him. So, good. Jean has some pertinent information that she'd like to share.
box. Well, I'm getting ready for these guests. Oh, that's great. You're probably like, no, it doesn't work with glass on the floor. I didn't know you say that. I know that for sure. But I had to get an early start. There's lots of kids to serve, honey. We needed a full suit of armor. Ready. Cool. Do you like our new kids to make an armor gun craft or something? No. No, what do you say, girls? We're gonna learn how to put armor on these three new guests. Um, and, and then, with that armor, we'll have a big archer. Sword! You know we're not using real armor, we're using real swords, right? This is CBS that talks about the armor of God, not real armor. We're gonna try to get the kids to understand what it means to put on the full armor of God and stand firm in the Lord. Yeah, you know, from Ephesians 6. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. That's how we're gonna get kids ready for battle. Spiritual battle. Because we want kids to learn what it means to walk with the Lord and stand firm in him and fight Satan's lies. Kids are registered. 46. Okay. We're thinking and planning and praying for up to 70. So we've got some more kids who hopefully who are registered that thought they were registered, but they will register. So keep praying for it. Look forward to a fantastic week. We're starting a new summer growing season series today for the, the message, and then it will be a carryover into the Sunday school time. So we'll continue to talk about the same subject, which is God, the fatherhood of God. What does it mean about who God is? And so it's a, Sunday school will be a time to interact. Maybe there's something that was said in the message you want to probe a little bit further. Maybe there's some questions you brought on the subject or just popped to your mind as you'd like to ask, and they'll have other information that we can go through as we talk about God in both times. And Huge subject in no way is, are we going to explore everything there is, but we want to do attempt to hit the, the major points and explore and think about God. So during this service and then during Sunday school as well. Ushers, would you come please so we can worship by giving of our offerings to the Lord? Let's bow together please to pray. Lord, again, we just thank you for new life and for Bentley and that you would bless him and his family and Grateful that family members are here today and could experience this together. And as we as part of a family, a church family, could come around and support. So we pray again for this special little life that you would be upon him and strengthen him and draw him to you. 
We pray that you would be with all the kids who are anticipating coming to VBS, parents, and that they would come. It would be a thrilling and exciting time to learn about how they can stand firm in the battle against sin, the devil, and the world system, and be standing strong for the Lord. We pray for you to come alongside of Jeff Mahalski, whose mom died this week, and as the funeral will be this next Thursday, that you would help him and his dad and his brother and his nieces, his nephews, his kids, his wife, to all go through this process and that they would depend upon you for their, their strength and vitality. And you draw them to you in a way that they haven't been able to previously, but now that they would be, again, brought close to you. That's the thing that we all need, Lord, to be brought closer to you. We thank you, God, for working in the lives of people who have had surgery, for Edna Stern's sister, for Matt Nelson, that the surgeries went well, continue to bring healing to them. And we thank you, God, for what you have done. We also look around us, and as we come, we know that we need rain. We need lots of rain, Lord, so we pray that you would send it and that it would be able to replenish the earth and refresh it and for the crops and for gardens and things, God. We just pray that you would send us the rain that we need. Send us again, we could say, spiritual rain that we need on our dry hearts that you would help us to be able to bear good seed because you watered it and would care for it and that we would bear fruit in, in, the, in our own lives, but also as we share the good news of Jesus with other people. Thank you, God, that we could spend time together today to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As the words on the screen said, that we don't understand when we don't see everything about God's plan, that we don't see what's happening, we can trust his heart. And we can sing together the, about the good, the great, the wonderful things that God has done. Would you stand together, please, as we sing, To God be the glory, great things he has done.
Please be seated. It's been said that the greatest thought that people can have is what they think about God. That may cause our heads to nod. Yeah, that's true, but why is it true? What is there about that? Well, we can say if there's a God, if there is a supreme being who is over everything, then it's logical that the accurate thoughts about God are the greatest things we can think about. The problem is there are some very inaccurate things. A.W. Tozer wrote the classic book, The Knowledge of the Holy, and in it, the first chapter, which is titled, Why We Must Think Rightly About God, he says this, We tend by a secret law of the soul to move toward our mental image of God. Were we able to extract from any person a complete answer to the question, what comes into your mind when you think about God? We might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that person. A right conception of God is basic not only to systematic theology, but to practical Christian living as well. It is to worship that the foundation of is it is to worship what the foundation is to the temple. Where it is inadequate or out of plumb, the whole structure must sooner or later collapse. I believe there is scarcely an error in doctrine or a failure in applying Christian ethics that cannot be traced finally to what men people, people think about God, that they have imperfect, and he says, ignoble thoughts about God. All the problems of heaven and earth, though they were to confront us together and at once, would be nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of God, that he is, what he is like, and what we as moral beings need to do. So necessary to the church is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, the church with her worship and her moral standards declines along with it. The heaviest obligation lying upon the Christian church today is to purify and elevate her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and of her. The Bible is chiefly about God. It reveals who he is and what he does. And the book of Isaiah is kind of unique in the Old Testament in the way that it captures the character and work of God. I've enjoyed reading through it as a part of my time I'm in that spot. And notice there lots of th times I say, oh, that's talking just about God, his character, what he's accomplishing, what he desires. And when we get to chapter 40, there is a break and it changes from chapter 40 through the end of the book. It begins to look forward. Part of it is 150 years in the future from Isaiah when the people of Israel return from the captivity in Babylon. Part of it goes to the time of Jesus Christ as it speaks of the forerunner, who would be John the Baptist, who would talk about and prepare the way for Jesus the Messiah. And then it looks even farther in the future, yet for farther in the future than where we are to Christ coming back to earth in his rule and reign. The chapter opens with speaking God, speaking words of comfort to people. And the end of verse 9 says this, Here is your God! And it goes into a lengthy description of who he is. He's not just the God of the Jews, but the God of the Jews and Gentiles, as Isaiah clarifies in many places, as clarifies throughout the rest of Scripture, Old and New Testament. It says, here is your God. Lisa Hankerson is going to come read some of that. So if you're in Isaiah chapter 40, she'll begin reading at chapter at verse 10 and going through verse 28. So you can follow along or just listen as she reads. <laughs> he is a sovereign Lord who comes with power, and his arm rules for him. He is rewarded with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms. He carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those that have young. Who has 
measured the waters in the hollow of a hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens. He has held the dust of the earth in the basket, or weighed the mountains on scales, and the hills in the balance. He has understood the mind of the Lord, or who did the Lord consult to enlighten him, and who taught him the right way. Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor is animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by men as worthless and even less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman cast it, the goldsmith overlays it with gold, and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such offering collects wood that will not last. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? It has been told from you. It has been told to you from the beginning. Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of earth, and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy, and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught, and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them and they wither, and the whirlwind sweeps them away like that. To whom would you compare me? Or who is my equal? says the Holy One. Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who, he who brings out the starry hosts one by one, and calls them each by name, because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My cause is disregarded by God? Do you not know, and have you not heard? The Lord is everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one to death. Thank you, Lisa. There's a lot there, and we're not going to be able to get to everything that is in that passage, but we're going to hit some of the spots and amplify a few of the things and just let your mind soak in the rest of what it says about the greatness of God. We begin with verse 10, where it says, God is the king. He's the sovereign Lord. He's not just a ruler, but the supreme ruler over all. He has no rivals, no one comes close to him. A little later in the book, God reveals himself again and again and again with words like, before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I am the first and I am the last. I, apart from me, there is no God. Is there any God besides me? No, there is no other rock. Saints of previous eras would often say that God is God all by himself. Saying there is no other God. Something we need to remember and keep thinking about. There is no other God. Second thing we find, verse 10 again, that God is strong. He has power in his arm, rules for him. Arm in the Bible frequently mentioned, talks about strength. God isn't merely strong, but he is all-powerful, almighty, omnipotent. He has power to do whatever he pleases that is, in, that is consistent with his pleasures and his will and his character. He's completely in control of himself, the physical universe, the spiritual realm. He is in charge. The difference between God's power and human power is 
shown in the repeated questions of verse 12. The obvious answer is for humans, nope, nobody can do those things. Though humans have created massive canals like Suez or Panama, they've traveled to the moon, peered through space telescopes into the vast universe, leveled mountains with bulldozers and explosives. But these feats are nothing compared to with God, what he has done, who has, as we're putting it in anthropomorphisms, which is speaking of God in human terms, because we can't understand God in God terms. So God stoops to our level and says, comparatively, human terms, says that he holds the waters, he's measured the waters in his hand. All the waters of the earth in his hand. And then it says that he has marked off the heavens with the breath of his hand. Thumb tip, fingertip. God's hand covers the entire universe. He's held the dust of the earth in a basket and he's weighed the mountains on scales. God shows his arm and his strength for people who are followers of Jesus Christ in innumerable ways. And we'll get to more of that as we continue through the series, and we'll get to the chief way through the rest of the series. But the primary way that God shows his arm and his strength is through the cross, through Jesus Christ dying for us, through him coming to give his life so we wouldn't have to pay for our sins. <clears throat> Thirdly, verse 11, God is a shepherd. The powerful king of the universe is also a gentle shepherd. Some people think about God and his transcendency, which means that he is over, above, beyond everything. He's other, he's different from humans, from anything in the earthly realm. And they can't perceive or understand God, and since they can't fully perceive or understand him, they view him as being aloof, that he's distant. He's just kind of maybe started things, and then he took off for some other place and just let people get about their business, do whatever happens. They make him to be a very impersonal being. We have to remember that God's transcendence, his otherness, is balanced by his imminence meaning he's knowable, he's personal, he's perceivable, he's relatable, he's present and intimately involved with people. The analogy is of a shepherd, of a gentle shepherd who lovingly cares for a sheep, binds the wounds, takes care of them, protects them, is there, lets the sheep sleep in his lap, is very up close and personal, and said, this is God. One aspect. And it brings us to one of the great words from the story of Christ's birth, Emmanuel, God with us. Not just a God way out there, but God is with us and near. Fourthly, we come to the fact that God is all-knowing in verses 13 and 14. And there are more questions to asked about, well, who instructed God? Who counseled God? Who told God what to do? It'd be like an infant trying to explain relativity to Einstein to give him some ideas. That he pales in comparison. But he says, what human can wise enough to tell God, this is how you make a giraffe. This is how you put DNA together. This is how you put the stars out in space so they're not colliding and blowing everything up. Nobody could do that. And we'll focus on the next one a little bit more because it really expands on all these things that God is incomparable. Nothing can compare to him. Everything is puny compared to him. It says that the nations are like a drop in the bucket, which is one of those biblical phrases that people don't realize comes from the Bible, but they talk about it. But something's a drop in the bucket. Think about what that means. In the rain last night, Maybe it was a little bit more than a drop in a bucket. We need a lot more. But if you had a bucket, it doesn't matter whether the bucket is full of water already or it's empty. You put one drop in a full bucket, and now you say, wow, 
look, we've got all this extra water. We can water the garden completely because there's so much more water now that we put that one little drop in there. Nope. Same way if it's an empty bucket and you put one drop in there. And now you're going to water the entire garden with that one drop. It doesn't make any difference. Nations are like a drop in the bucket, God says, because he says, I am powerful over them. They, they mean nothing, really. They're absolutely nothing. They're even less than nothing. It's pretty hard to get less than nothing, isn't it? But that's what he said. They're, they're, they're nothing, less than nothing compared to me because God is stressing his power and his authority over governments and he does it again in verses 23 and 24 where they're com compared to plants that wither because the wind comes and just blows them away and they go to nothingness. Now, not much has changed since Isaiah's time because people were trying to make comparisons between God and what they wanted for gods, and people would take a chunk of wood, and half of it was used for fire to prepare meals and then for warmth. With the rest, they fashioned into a god, an idol for them to worship. And then the maker prayed to it and said, Save me, you are my god. God's reaction? They know nothing. Talking about the people. They understand nothing. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see, and their minds closed so they cannot understand. No one stops to think. No one has the knowledge or understanding to say, half of it, half of it I used to make fuel, and I baked bread over it. I roasted meat, and I ate. Then, oh, good idea. Maybe I shall make a detestable idol out of the rest, because now, it, because I make an idol, it becomes an idol said, shall I bow down to a block of wood? Something that they've created? And then God says, such a pers person feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? They don't want to be lies, so they're pretending that it's true. Do people think they have a better idea than God? And we live in a world where people try to make God in their own image. While some in our time do use gold or silver or wood or stone to make their God, others adopt maybe a more sophisticated approach, and they construct God in their minds the way that they want he, she, or it to be, and so that they basically are in control over this God that they've made, and God will do whatever they want, hopefully. One of the fastest growing religions in America talks about a God that's constantly changing. Now, they might re re not refer to themselves as a religion, but that's really what they are because they're worshiping people, and it's, it's the trans agenda where they talk about queering Jesus and then have their prayers addressed to, oh, queer queen and old oh, trans man, the one that constantly changes and perverse. Hesitate to bring it up, but we need to know what's going on and what people are doing, what they really are worshiping, because they're worshiping man instead of the creator. As followers of Jesus Christ, we need to stand firmly against such horrendous error little more pleasant illustration. When Gene and I go to our grandkids, they like to have us read. And the granddaughters had a book this week that I got to read and Gene didn't. So oh, that doesn't usually happen. Uh, I got the, the, this book. It's part of the Monkey and Cake series. Monkey and Cake are gifted with abilities to speak and do all these things, and they're best friends. So Monkey tells Cake that there's a box, and inside this box is a kitty. But when you open the box, the kitty disappears. Cake has a hard time believing this, and they go back and forth for a while, and finally Cake has an idea said, well, I want to imagine that there's a dinosaur in the box. And when you open the box, the dinosaur disappears. So they go back and forth for a while, and they both finally decide, you can believe kitty in there, you can believe... Uh, dinosaur in there, they say, okay, let's go and let's have some pie to eat. It's kind of a weird thing. <laughs> but at the end, after they're gone, the, the picture shows that there's a kitty peeking its head out of the box. It hasn't disappeared. 
And then the next thing shows that the kitty is riding the back of the dinosaur. Cute. Power of imagination. But the problem is people equate what they imagine with reality. And people want a box, and inside that they want to put this thing called God to imagine whatever it is. And then, hopefully, they can just ignore him. And that he really doesn't appear, he doesn't really come out of the box, and really doesn't do anything, but just vanishes. As long as he stays inside, and maybe they can get what they need, or come. sometimes they're fine with it, because, again, they want control. People of Isaiah's time did that. We do that. God said to the people back then, said, These people come near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, You did not make me. Can the pot say of the potter, he knows nothing? People today are doing the reverse. It's, they want to be in control and in charge. Dostoevsky is a famous Russian novelist. He wrote the book Brothers Karamazov. He said this, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. If God does not exist, everything is permissible. And that's the way people want it. They don't want a God messing with them, God interfering with their plans. They want no God, no moral law, nothing that leads to punishment or anything. Just want to be free. And that's where we are in society. A professor of religion at Temple University commented about 25 years ago, said, if God doesn't change, we are in danger of losing God. If you believe in an eternal, unchanging God, you'll be in trouble. And people want to be in charge and say, God needs to adapt to who we are. He's got to change. Really, the problem is if you don't believe in an eternal, unchanging God, you're going to be the person who's in a heap of trouble. And these attitudes, however, have filtered into God's people. Or sometimes we want a God who we can control that we call upon only if necessary, not have them be involved too much in our lives. I'm speaking of the broader, all Christianity. We need to be on guard that we don't try to create God in our image, but we need to follow God as the Bible reveals him and to, be, and to modify ourselves. Verses 21 through 26 talk about God as the creator, and he has more questions. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Basically, how can you not have heard? How can you not have understood? Don't you have eyes and ears? Haven't you been paying attention? And he talks about the evidence for existence of God's readily available in what we see around us, what we experience with our senses. And then he dares comparisons to be made in 25 and 26, basically saying, let's have a contest. You bring the best you have, and I'll bring the best I have, and let's see who wins. Not fair contest. We think of the wonders of creation, just one aspect that we can think of with picture related to the stars. Some astronomers say that our universe is 92 billion light years across. It has 100 billion galaxies with 100 billion stars. That comes out the math. 10 to the 24th power or 10 to the 26th power. I'm not sure why there's such a difference. But when you get that big, there's not much difference in that. But it said the immensity of what God has created. And again, they're all in their places. And then we read, it said, he knows each star by name. All those hundreds of billions and trillions, quadrillions and septillions and whatever kind of trillions there are. God wins. People can paint stars, take photos. God's done all the other work. He's also the sustainer. That he cares and he's with us. Look again at the end of the chapter, verse 28 that Lisa read. Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow weary, tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. A particular phrase, some translations said that it's inscrutable. When was the last time you used the word inscrutable? 
It's not something we really talk about a whole lot, so I consulted dictionaries, one of Cliff's favorite dictionaries, the Webster's 1828 version, which gives really good definitions. And it said this about inscrutable. Unsearchable. That cannot be searched into and understood by inquiry or study. That cannot be penetrated, discovered, or understood by human reason. That's what it means to be un inscrutable. Now, my mind thought, okay, they put a prefix in in front of that. Is there really a word scrutable? You probably use that even less. There is, which means that it can be discovered by inquiry or critical examination related to scrutiny. And the versions later changed inscrutable to unsearchable. So the argument for God is that you can't really fathom his knowledge. And that if he's able to perform the massive task of creating everything, how could he become tired and weary in the comparatively small task of caring for and protecting his people? As it says, verse 29, 30, and 31, he gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The king, the creator, the sustainer, God, will not falter or lessen. He's unaffected by age or the passing of the time. He does, his senses don't get slower and weaker. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't need a nap to spread out a blanket on the grass and just snooze up for a little while. He doesn't need a five-hour energy drink or beet chews or any other supplement to make sure that he's performing up to par. He doesn't need to consult the angels or gather the rest of the Trinity together to try to figure out what to do by playing rock, paper, scissors, because he just can't, doesn't have the wherewithal to make decisions. He doesn't get tired. He is the amazing God who hasn't forgotten us. He has compassion. His understanding of us is mixed with compassion. He gives strength to the weak and the tired. We don't need to give in to despondency or thoughts that God doesn't care. Since God is who he is, nothing is too difficult for him. It's bigger than any problem, any difficulty. Five-year-old Karen busied herself with a new Bible storybook that she got. She was busy circling the word God any time it appeared. Her mom saw her. Her first response was to say, No! You don't treat books that way. But mom held her peace for a little bit and said, what, Why are you doing this? And the five-year-old Karen said, So that I will know where to find God when I need him, when I want him. We know where to find God when we want him or need him. It's called the Bible. He's there. We can find him. We can understand him. Try to understand him. It's unfathomable, unsearchable. We can come and look and see what God is and what he has for us, what he's doing. Because he's there waiting. Shows up. You can find me. One of the great preachers of the past, Charles Spurgeon, said this. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then go plunge yourself in the Godhead's deepest sea. Be lost in his immensity. You shall come forth as from a couch of rest, refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing which can comfort the soul, so calm the swelling billows of sorrow and grief, so speak peace to the minds of trial as a devout musing upon God. There's our challenge. Go think about God. Father, thank you that we can come to you and address you as Father and that you are the God who is immense beyond our capacity to understand, but you, you are near and you've drawn near to us through the person of Christ and your word that shows us. May we draw near to you to know more about you and love you more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand please as we sing together a song that We'll worship the king, and that's one of the main responses we have, that we put ourselves in place, and him in his place, and we worship him. <clears throat>
Help us really to get lost in the sea of Godness, of who God is, and just marvel at you. May that be who we are, people who worship you and love you, and that then live out our lives because of the greatness of who you are and what you've done through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. Amen. <laughs>